behind, but that's okay. We have a wonderful presentation, our last one right before our lunch break. Um, and this one is uh, a designing, you know, I lost my piece of paper. It's all about accessibility, which is a huge priority. And um, it, it gives me great pleasure to bring up here from Shared Services Canada. We have Julianne and Jeffrey, Julianne Rathwell and Jeffrey Stark. Look at that. I remembered that, but not the, not the title of the presentation. Um, but that's okay. So they're gonna come on up here and get set up for you. So, uh, and don't be shy. If you're hiding in the back, you can move up a little bit closer, right? We're, we're all open. We're open, we're collaborative. Just throwing in some tag words here. Okay, so uh, here you go, Julianne. So we're ready to go. Ooh, hello guys. Good morning, gang. Um, we're here to talk about uh, accessibility because uh, all of a sudden accessibility is sexy all over again. So uh, we're going to talk about it in the context of open government. More importantly, ensuring that open government is inclusive government, inclusive for all, including people with disabilities. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, open government, open data, open source initiatives, and how uh, accessibility weaves into all of that. I'll just say I myself, I'm Jeffrey Stark. Uh, I'm the program manager of the Accessibility Accommodation and Adaptive Computer Technology Program at Shared Services Canada. Maybe I got the job because I can say it all in one breath, who knows. But, uh, and I have Juliana Roswell, one of our accessibility subject matter experts. So first, before we get into a lot of that, we'll just quickly give you a little context of who we are and what, what our group does because if you don't have enough information during this session, well, we work with every government department in this space. So whether that's uh, the program itself or the Treasury Board Accessibility uh, Working Group that I chair and uh, Juliana participates in or through other initiatives or activities because for us, it's all about building capacity. How are we doing, by the way? So our program, we've been in this space 27 years. We were a part of the first government department to give everybody a computer at their desk. Then we saw the one size fits all really didn't work for everybody. We looked for expertise in the private and public sector, didn't exist, had to bring it up from the universities in the states. That's how we started. Then Treasury Board found out about us. They basically said, look a little further than the end of your nose. And fast forward to today, uh, through their funding and partnerships, we now work with just about every government department on this topic. What's interesting is that we've even received international recognition for the stuff we do. So um, there's lots of opportunity today, lots of interactions in a whole variety of ways. Uh, if you're looking for information on our services, they kind of break down into three areas. We do things for people. So if you have a disability, we've got subject matter experts who know about each category of disability, whether we're talking about vision, hearing, cognitive, learning. Because in this space, when you look up accessibility, it's often just talking about one category of user in one way. We view it as a, uh, we've got simple and complicated solutions, always trying to go for the simplest option, recognizing that there's even complex tools. So, for example, if you guys were in a body cast and all you could do was breathe, we could still give you computer access. So what that means is no sick leave for any of you. Right? <laughs> what we learned really early on in the process was that, yes, we have an emphasis on the end user in terms of their technology, but really we've got a, a large obligation long before we get there. We actually have to build capacity early on. And so for us, we don't just look at focusing on the end user. We've got a whole unit, unit that focuses on inclusive design and accessibility in IT systems and services. Whether that's training courses for developers, courses for technicians, courses for managers, courses for end users, and so on. And we also do testing in this space. I talk about these things because I think it's an important backdrop when we're talking about accessibility or inclusive design. Right now with upcoming legislation, this is the hot topic, right? We often get asked, well, how much is enough? How far do we have to go? 
what actually are our obligations in government in this space? We usually talk about the fact that it's not just external, it's internal. It's not just the front facing stuff. It starts with the conception of something. We talk about the fact that the Canadian Human Rights Act basically defines people with disabilities as a protected population. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms basically says uh, that and the Canadian Rights Act says that we have to accommodate up until the point of undue hardship. Undue hardship is looked at in three areas, health, safety or cost. Not just on the individual working for the government or that person who wants to come into a facility. It touches every aspect of every area of our work, whether we're, it's, whether we're talking about the systems or services or information or documents or material. We've got an obligation to provide information in a timely fashion and usable format. We've even got policies internally that say that we're supposed to be examining all systems and identifying barriers, eliminating those barriers and building inclusion in before we actually physically accommodate an individual. So finding problems, fixing problems, looking to standards to ensure that when we look at material, we're following something that's measurable. How far do we go? Undo hardship. So for me, the best reference for this is when you guys ask me, how far do I have to go? How much work do I have to do? Is accessibility even relevant? Because when we create data sets or when we create content or when we're putting up documents or material, how far do we have to go? Well, in the courts, we can actually, you know, argue undo hardship along three measures. We can say, ah, I didn't accommodate because it would put the health or safety of someone at risk. So you could say, I didn't hire the blind guy to drive the mail truck for such. Our third measure is cost. So in the courts, in order to argue cost, in a small scenario where I'm running a mom and pop shop, cost is easy. You can say, I may not be, I'm only running two flights or two planes, uh, and ultimately, uh, we're not even pulling a profit as it is, so I can't ensure this requirement because I don't have the pockets to do so. In a government context, we actually would have to argue that it would bankrupt the federal government or the department in, case, in question because it's not about the project, it's not about the activity, it's as how we handle this stuff, which seems like a tall order. It seems like a lot of work and it can be a lot of work, but there's definite tools and approaches that can be taken that ensure that it's easy as possible. We also have upcoming, so, so the biggest challenge in that space is the fact that, what's that? Ten. Oh, I'm already, mm -hmm. all right. So what's critical is we have upcoming legislation. Right now it's all complaint driven. The upcoming legislation basically will require us to be proactive, to demonstrate, to show what steps we're taking to make sure that when we have someone or when we have a system or software service we're building, we're being inclusive, as inclusive as possible and including people with disabilities. So I will just say, if you walk away with no one thing today and you want to know where to learn about this topic, to consult on your projects or activities, to learn about options and technology, best practices and so on, we do a lot in that area, reach out. What's interesting is if you Google the term accessibility, you will get 101 interpretations of what that is. You will get everybody's viewpoint, not even necessarily talking about end users with disabilities or the general public or any of that stuff. Uh, it may be just one user's requirements. I went to the conference on technology and people with disabilities. This is my favorite example. And I went to a session that was labeled how we made the Harry Potter website accessible. Wizards and technology and accessibility? Like, it doesn't get sexier than that in my view. I went in there so excited. I walked out of there going, that's 45 minutes of my life I'll never get back. Because essentially when we talked in the halls, what that session should have been labeled was how we made the Harry Potter website work for one user in one way using one technology in one version. And how if we go have any change in that scenario, so new version of the product, new user, 
new technology, different disability, how we have to go back and do it all over again. So for me, when I define accessibility, I actually define it as a set of standards. There are standards for just about everything out there, from to software to hardware, from mobile phones to desktop software, from documents to materials. There's lots of best practices and guidelines we can follow. Recognizing in addition to that, we also have to ensure that we are in doing inclusive usability testing and documenting what we're doing and where our deficiencies are and how people can get engaged in that when they need help or when something isn't working because it's about leveraging the community as well. So when we talk about this space, we often talk about vision replacement technology. I think it's critical to realize that if there's a whole cornucopia of users, like even in the space of the Government of Canada, we have over 130 different software <coughs> products and 4,000 different technical aids that can be used in any spot, whether we're talking mobile phones or desktop computers or what have you. So in this case, we're going to show you an example of one user's experience when accessing content and how when the interfaces we design, the content we create, mm -hmm. the material that's there uh, is not present in the underlying code and activities we build and create, how a user's experience can be not always as positive. So in this case, we've got a user, and we've got a video here, where a user is a federal public servant, actually, is uh, organizing travel. It's one of his passions, also part of his job. And how he's going on a website using a tablet, touch screen, but he's not using the touch screen as a mouse. He's using it as a keyboard. If you look really closely, you'll notice that there's a transparent keyboard drawn over the screen. So, Jeff, there's just a little problem. They can't actually get the video to play, so we can't actually Excellent. see what's going on here. Well, there you go. We need some uh, audio description. or uh, well, I will just say content, that so. we have a photo, I think, on the screen. Yes, we do. Okay, so you won't get to see the user experience. Let's just say dude can navigate Windows. He can navigate the browser. He can use the websites that he uses every day but he goes to this travel website and there's a piece of this travel website that he cannot activate by keyboard. He can't get the focus to the calendar. He can go everywhere else. So he can get someone to come in, yes, to help pick his date, pick uh, for travel. And then we get to fast forward 20 minutes in, he hits the submit button and ultimately you get to hear him swear like a sailor because the site goes back and says, oh, your session has timed out. Go back and do this all over again. For me, that's an unexpected, unacceptable user experience. So when we're thinking about how we design systems and interfaces and user experiences, it is critical that we start by talking about what needs to be there by default and not just focus on one user's requirements in one way. Following standards and recognizing that we have that 130 different pieces of software and 4,000 different technical aids. Greatest way to do that is to look at what you're building, what you're designing, what you're creating. If it's documents, there's guidelines to follow. If there's software, there's software guidelines to follow. We ourselves make use of the European Union's Accessible Procurement Toolkit in this space, specifically because everybody else is using it anyway. They've got a requirements generator where you can say, oh, I'm buying a cloud computing system. What requirements should I include? Oh, I'm asking for a service to be provisioned, a piece of software, a piece of hardware, multifunction printer. You pick the categories. It comes out with te technical and functional standards that are accepted internationally because the European Union's using it, Australia's using the same measures, New Zealand, the Japanese government, even the Americans are using similar requirements. So it gives us a base measure. For web, for example, it's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And it gives us the test, or it gives us the evaluation grid to follow 
when we're looking at how we meet those requirements. It also gives us functional requirements, performance statements, so we can say it's usable by this audience or that audience. So we get that mix of both pieces. If we start using that as our baseline, we move a little further. You want to take that? Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So what we're actually going to look at now, once we've gone through a little bit of a baseline of what accessibility is, what kind of standards exist, or how it applies to open government and open data and open standards. So one of the biggest things is data should be discoverable and understandable by humans and machines. That means there's a difference between human readable and machine readable data or content. And so when we're looking at what we put up in an open data portal, it's not just data sets. And it's how people can interact with it and use it. Next slide, please. So when you're looking at open data principles, they talk about it being public, accessible, described, reusable, complete, timely, and managed post-release. These actually all affect accessibility. So if something is public, people have access to it, they can go and look for it. It's something that people can kind of find a way that the perception then is that there is some level of human readable content to that. So then when we're looking at accessible, we want to say that anything that you're putting up for open data or open government falls under being uh, accessible. There's tons of standards that we apply to that. The W3C actually has a best practice guide that really works for this because they talk about the best practices to releasing open data. And there's 32 of them that directly relate to all of these types of fundamental principles and to ensure that it's interoperable, that if we're using an API to do our data and we're going to be publishing it out on the web and people are extracting it, that it actually is required to mandatedly go through web standards. So it has to actually meet accessibility for how we're putting it up. Now when we're displaying it, then it's whether or not we're displaying it on the web and it's human readable or whether or not it's something that's downloadable which may be either human readable or machine readable. So machine readable means that we can take that, transform it into something someone can use. In an open data context, it's really challenging because we look at whether or not people know how to use it. What technical requirements are we putting on people to know how to use and or manipulate our data? Uh, next slide, please. So there are best practices that I talked about. Talk about, sorry for the quality of the image. Reuse, comprehension, linkability, discoverability, trust, access, interoperability, and portability. Uh, we'll talk about how they can actually move between different types of platforms and different types of file formats that allow people access. So there's a lot of talk about things like PDFs. PDFs are not super great for things like your mobile or your tablet. They don't render the content the same way. They're not responsive in design and don't support complex structures like complex data tables. EPUB 3 actually has built-in support to help you do that and will probably be what replaces most of PDFs everywhere within the next 10 years. Um, so that is something that you talk about whether or not it's accessible and interoperable because the EPUB 3, you can use almost the same type of validation or testing that you would use for the web to ensure that it's actually meeting standards to make it accessible for as many people as possible. And when we're putting anything in an open data uh, platform, we can't say that, oh, the general audience is not the people intended to use it because we are putting it out there because we want people to look. So whether it's a high school student who's going out and going looking at the data we're putting out, Someone in university, someone who's writing a book on something and they need access to data or information that we have released, it needs to be available in a digestible and comprehensible format. Next slide, please. So the benefits to doing this um, will be basically that we can reuse it, we can have it shared across platforms, that if you're going to do it in web, you're going to do it downloadable, it doesn't matter, and that there's interaction across uh, diverse groups. Uh, the next slide, please. So one of the things, there are multiple things that the Government of Canada is actually doing, as Jeff earlier talked about, WET, but it's also using things like GitHub and partnershiping between different departments and using collaboration to put things out in the open. So we've got Transport Canada, they just launched their skill set for Alexa, it's out on GitHub, people can actually go and do a pull request or do something with it. The Canadian Digital Service is doing it, Statistics Canada has done it for their data visualizations, and we're kind of seeing that collaborative effort where we're pushing everything out is available for feedback, consultation, talk about it, what do we need to do to change it, and allow that to become an open source thing that we're using across the government because it will benefit all Canadians. So we're doing that, almost all of these are having to follow through guidelines of like WCAG 2.0. The government will be adopting WCAG 2.1 in the near future. It will be part of the new enterprise architecture standards. So we will see that. The next slide, please. 
So how you can get involved in open source is you literally do anything you would do with it, something like GitHub is you'd go and you'd make an account and you kind of contribute, you pull requests, you fork projects and you see what people are doing. You can contact the people who are doing WET, um, which is Pierre Dubois and Mario Benito um, from Service Canada. Or you can look at doing things like attending their weekly code sprints, get set up for help, on-site support, and most of these things are going to have gone through those accessibility testing, so they're going to actually help you build on that. Uh, the next slide, please. And I'll put you, Jeff. Yeah, so just to close out around WET, WET's a really good example of how open source was used as a method for solving a lot of complicated problems across government, where we didn't Sorry. want just one 100 and 200 or 300 or 400 simple interactions that where developers were spending their time coding the same thing over and over and over again, trying to solve the same problems. We wanted to make sure that when we were looking to make things accessible, that we started from the genesis of uh, the creation, that the building blocks that we built with. I mean, how many expand and contract widgets do we really need to redevelop over and over again. So for me, open source uh, collaboration, if you want the best example of that, that it was accessible and inclusive and cross-government, what is the perfect example? And it continues to be worked on today. Because when we talk about accessibility, it's not something you do at the end. It's something you do from the beginning, from the genesis of things. It's not something that is one person's job Go send it to the accessibility expert and hope he'll figure out after you've developed something how to make this work. It's got to be from the conception all the way through the process. And it's really about building an ecosystem that supports us in this space to be inclusive by design and accessible by default instead of trying to retrofit after the fact. It is an area that requires leadership and governance so in our project planning, we need to ask, what standard are we following? At what level and how are we ensuring this? We don't just solve it today, because in an iterative, agile environment, we're actually constantly in a mode of change. We have to weave it in so that everybody on a project, every developer, every person involved has at least a baseline understanding of what their role is in that activity. Recognizing that if everybody does have that understanding, it's not hard if we're all working together. It only becomes hard the further along in the process we get. So we're posting documents. Well, we needed to think about accessibility when we created those documents. Even before that, when we created templates. Similarly, in every other stream of content we would put up. So with that, I leave it to you guys to say it's not our role to make things accessible. It's everybody's role. We treat it like bilingualism or security. It's a horizontal business requirement. And together, it's achievable. And it's reasonable to assume that the things that we create, every Canadian citizen will be able to access, including people with disabilities. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeffrey and Julianne. Did you want to... One question. Go ahead, sir. I think that your mic's on there. Uh, one of the things I didn't hear was French. Are we using, are we using things like GitHub to avoid the e French issue, where if I send an email to more than one federal government employee, it has to be in both languages, and replies have to be in both languages? And it also happens on forums as well. Are we using GitHub to avoid that? Uh, and no. if we are, what's the cost? I don't think that we're actually using it to avoid that. The documentation should be for any of these projects available in French and people be able to answer questions in French. Our presentation actually should have been in two languages here. We do have it in two languages if you would like a copy of it. But anytime you communicate with anybody in the government, you should be able to get a response in the language of your choice. So, je parle un petit peu en français, but mon colleague, c'est trop bilingue. So. Oui, si tu as des questions, n'hésitez pas à les demander dans votre langue de choix. Et dans le, le, le monde de l'accessibilité, il y a beaucoup d'informations qui sont disponibles dans les deux langues. Ah oui, exactement. Mais le problème, ce n'est pas ça. Le problème est, comment nous collaborons Comment nous avons des programmes programmes et développeurs qui prennent part dans la conversation 
Absolutely. I think we treat inclusion the same way. Inclusion isn't just about people with disabilities, right? We have to have an inclusive environment that includes everybody, including develop, ensuring that developers understand their obligations in both languages, their obligations in terms of accessibility and their obligations in terms of other horizontal business requirements. We really have to practice what we're preaching. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, sir. And thanks again, Jeffrey and Julianne. Very important topic to have here today to discuss. So your work is very, very valuable. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Our